the best I could tell you is one where it's like, like a Jason Bourne story in Colombia. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> but I hope that's a chapter just, in the book. You just wake man. up and there's those curtains of like being in a hospital, like Jason Bourne when he wakes up and he's just like, "What the? Where am I?" And you're just like, "Oh wow, what the heck? This is." <laughs> then you walk across the street and buy a coffee and you're back on the next the next plane home back to like back after the race uh, but it's like, I like wow it. Welcome to Brainstoke. We are so excited today to be in TJ Eisenhart's art studio. We are on site, and this is incredible. The art surrounding the legend of TJ, the cyclist, <laughs> artist. Excited to be here. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Thanks for joining me. This is super cool. Yeah, it's great. First time I've done a podcast in here. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's rad. This is totally cool. I'm not sure if you want tours coming through here <laughs> with buses rolling up, but you could sell some tickets. No, it's definitely a certain energy I want to I like to keep in here and uh it's such a safe space for me and a very sacred space for me and so when people are in here, you know, I don't know, it's just like a safe place a, a very safe place for me that I love and it's allowed me to create many things and so like certain people that I bring in here, I, they feel that energy. So I don't really even worry about people bringing in negative energy because it's like this studio like heals it. Like, <laughs> you can't be in a bad mood and like come in here. You usually leave if you like have like somebody like came in with a bad mood, they'll like just leave, you yeah. know, like or they'll be they'll feel good by the end, you know. Well, yeah. we're feeling the good vibe, man. Yeah. yeah. Surrounded with good colors. You're in a Hawaiian <laughs> shirt. You're repping it all. So we're excited to be here. In terms of the capability for us, Brainstoke, to be here, we want to thank Aspire Counseling Network and Aspire Medical, our two sponsors who are all things mental health in the state of Utah. So thank you to them. Here we go. Yeah, TJ. So uh, TJ Eisenhart is formerly a professional cyclist. Yeah. For BMC and yeah. Hollow Esco Citadel. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, you're... Uh, what would they would call a U23 national champion in time trial. Yeah. I think third place in the road race. Y yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that same year. Yeah, okay. 2015? Yep. Is that, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so we knew TJ. Uh, we, we ran into TJ roughly eight years ago in a, a little pastry, French pastry coffee shop here in Santa Clara, Utah. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, that's where we began to learn about this this amazing uh, junior cyclist out of Utah, and all of a sudden, every every cyclist in Utah grew to love and cheer and want TJ to win everything. At least that's what I remember as a fan, a Same. cycling fan. That sounds cool to okay. me. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's how I'll you, take it. And I remember being at many races, <clears throat> and you're you were surrounded um, always by your family. Yeah. I remember they often had big fat heads. Mm -hmm. Of TJ Eisenhart. Yeah, oh, I still have those. Do you remember those? Of course. I got the foam finger right behind you <laughs> from when we had the city of Cedar City sponsor me. Oh, I love it. I love it. So, I mean, obviously, your family has embraced and supported everything you've done. Um, <clears throat> what I think is amazing is how your your uh, maybe your career or your life has, has changed from being a professional cyclist to now you're a pro professional creator. Yeah. I think you've created the Imaginary Collective mm -hmm. uh, with a business partner. Yeah. You're still sponsored by many cycling brands, mm -hmm. Monster, Giro. Mm -hmm. uh, Monster? 100%. Yeah, yeah. Monster, Java. I feel like I'm home. <laughs> yep. I really do. Dude, yeah. as long as Preston's known me, I've, I've been a... Pay full retail price, you know, sponsored monster. Are you athlete. leaving with the shipment today? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Come on down. Oh. Lucky winner. <laughs> to, to, to kick this off, first question I've got for you is, can you remember the first piece of art that you created and what was it? The first piece of art I created or the first piece of art I sold? 
No, nah, I'm thinking created as uh, probably oh, when you were little. Yeah. I would ha I had this sketchbook that my mom would give to me when we'd sit in church to keep me from talking. <laughs> we all have those and books. And like uh, she just I just loved it. I would draw on it every day. I mean every those 3 hours in church and then uh it just progressed. My mom was then signing me up for cartoon drawing classes after swim lessons, you know, at the age of 5 or 6 and then like then you're signing up for liquid lead art drawing classes at the age of 10 and like just doing all these different cl classes and so like it's funny how just multi so many layers in my art that you can kind of see now with the cartoons and the different things so your mom fed your desire to be an artist yeah early long before the bike it sounds like oh yeah yeah me and my mom are like we're we're literally the same person. Like we're just like talk 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 or bicker <laughs> bicker. We I love her more than anything. Like we're the I call her every day. We're best friends. But yeah, she she's the toughest critic for my art and also the, the like the biggest believer. She was always signing me up. My dad was always signing me up for sports, of course. And then my mom was always signing me up for like guitar lessons or art. And she really just. So I don't know. I don't even know if you can see a potential in a kid that young. I think it's just about almost grooming them and not even like that maybe sounds weird, but just like, you know, she really loved doing art and she, yeah. <clears throat> my family really loved artists and art. And I, for some reason, they just kept signing me up for classes, which again, I don't think anybody's like born with anything. I think it's just... Like, you look at anybody that's great in anything, they were doing it when they were little. Yeah. You know, playing tennis when they were little or riding a bike. And then you just, just like kind of that saying that is, if you do 15 minutes a day, you're, it's like 1% better. So at the end of the year, you're 365% better. You just do that for your, your whole life or almost you're going to be really good, you know? Yeah. And it's like, I think people just forget the consistency that really is what, is like the icing on the cake. It's like there's layers to the cake, not just the frosting. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It sounds like uh, <clears throat> your mom was a huge proponent, you know, of development on the heels of Mother's Day. Talk more about your mom. Yeah. Maybe childhood and, and your, you know, your dad as well and your siblings. Yeah. So my parents have always believed in challenge, like challenging yourself through sports and creativity, you know, and uh, there's a lot of things... You know, I didn't like doing it as a kid. I didn't like waking up at 6.30 a.m. and then practicing my guitar for 30 minutes. I don't play the guitar now, but I have a major love for art. I mean, for music now. And I hated that then, or I didn't like doing <laughs> the art classes, of course, as a kid. But, like, a kid sh doesn't know what they want. They're, yeah. They're, yeah, yeah. There's five year, you're five years in a life or 12 years in a life. You have no idea, you know, and now look at me like, live like a retired lifestyle better than a retired lifestyle and i'm 28 years old and most people are like suffering in some type of corporate america and just hating life and everybody's depressed and having to take supplements or having to like they they feel anxiety and it's like nobody's getting enough sleep then nobody's like really taking care of themselves and because my mom and dad challenged me young and putting me in classes and allowing me to grow and challenge myself then it made me who I am now. I, there would be times I'd come home at like 10 years old. And of course I wanted to ride the bike and be a professional. But as a kid, you don't know that it takes hours and hours of commitment, you know. But my de parents did. They knew what it took because my sister and brother also did some type of professionalism in sports. And uh, so like my dad would be like, all right, let's go for a ride as soon as I got home from school from like fourth grade and I'd be like, oh, I don't want to go do that. I want to go play with my friends. And then we get on the ride and it was the best thing ever that bonding with my, my dad and like, you know, again, very close to my family. I want to be who I am without them. Uh, and now being a father myself, it's like you love your parents even more and like apologize for, for like <laughs> being the attitude. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Ooh. And I gave them a lot of attitude at times and uh, I just like, love them more than anything but it's like they just knew what was best and like how to like get me to where i wanted to go and they believed in me where most parents or most even people in your life will like tell you you need a backup plan but as soon as i was eight years old and we saw the tour de france 
I told my parents, I was like, that's what I, what I want to do. And then by the age of 10, I got a bike. And then by the age of 12, like I was second at the, for my first national championships. And then uh, by that time, they then were figuring out how to get me to graduate high school early. So like what it was going to take at that time. Yeah, yeah. So already thinking about classes I'd have to take in junior high to graduate high school early to then go to Europe and live in Europe to, when you're 16, 17. Yeah. So then when I was 17, 18, I was living in Europe without thinking about school while all my other teammates were still in school. Yeah. Like they were having to really challenge that time between. Yeah. So, uh, if someone was to define or try to describe TJ Eisenhart, I would think – someone would say he is so positive <laughs> and I, I just just sitting here and talking prior to recording uh, everything about what you do or say is super positive w where'd that come from uh oh definitely my mom and dad my dad's the most positive person i know my mom is super like also the most positive person i know and it's like they just have different layers too of that of how they express it and different layers. They love their most the most kindest people I know to strangers or people and they love everyone. They don't ever like they're super cool. So they just that's where it comes from. Especially if you meet them and you're like really understand them. You're like, oh it's like I'm literally and it's again just having a child, you really can see that like cookie cut out of your DNA from them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like see, you know, how much of my mom I am or how much of my dad I am and and you can kind of see in the future of what you could be like, you know, or just keep unless you kind of change in a way, you know, yeah. if you like it, keep going that way. Yeah. But no, I just they've always been I don't really don't even understand it. I, I think, again, it's just been from a child just being surrounded by positive people that don't look at life as like against them. They look at it as a blessing and as a gift. And I, I've never heard my parents like really complain about work. They're, they always did something they wanted to do in life, even though it was work. You know, like my dad w worked in foundations his whole life, but he worked in foundations he loved to work for, you know, like the Major League B Baseball Association or uh, Special Olympics or the Alpine School District. So, like, he enjoyed that. He loved doing that. He loved talking to people, having them, like, raise money for those. He loved going to the events. You know, then my mom was a history teacher for 40 years in high school for honors history and law. So she like was dealing with people all the time. So she's a people person and it just like they love to travel. And so like it's funny, it's just really <coughs> created me and it's rad. It's yeah. rad. That's <clears throat> Tell us a little bit about um, USA Cycling, getting into that uh, time of your life or the beginnings of your cycling career where you started, people started to know who you were, recognize that, hey, this this kid's got a, some talent. He could potentially go pro. That, yeah. What was that time like for you as probably an early teenager? That was like, again, my first national championships when I was 12. And uh, you finished second and it was like your first race. You're like... You knew you had something. And again, it you don't have anything. It's just that you just were a better kid, a better rider at that. Yeah. Like it's, but it just, I think that just then gave confidence to my parents and everybody like, okay, like he's pretty talented at this, at that time. Let's keep like feeding this. But again, like all it, all it is in the end is just consistency and day in and day out because yeah. there were many kids that beat me and like, when I was a junior, when I was 15, 16, I wasn't very good, like at all. And then for some reason, my body just kind of hit a little Grossberg or it just kind of like, I don't know, it just grew a little and it just gave me that like muscle where I then just won every race. I won literally every junior big race that you could win, like that every pro won. So then that made every, you know, every pro team want to like talk to me. And it was crazy t at that time I was, 17 18 and like people were flying to europe to meet my parents and like i would be in europe and it was because they knew how like important my parents were yeah and so like they would like fly out there and like smooth them and everything <laughs> like different agents and everything different teams and then just again of course because like bmc was the biggest team in the world at that time they had cadell evans george and greg van avermaet philippe gilbert 
Like literally, like everyone, and uh, Thor Hushoff, and uh, they they were creating that development team, and it was like a no brainer. We got all the same product that the pros got. Stayed where the pros like stayed with it. We were literally on the pro team, just not doing the pro yeah, schedule. Yeah, well, like, a well not, funded, not the top pro schedule, because we were still doing the the lower tier tier pro pro races in France and like Italy and stuff like that. So they were still like pro. They just weren't a UC, the UCI pro. Yeah, and so yeah, signed for them, and it was just like it basically was like all your hard work throughout all your years of being a junior, just like totally you just got there you're like oh wow i just achieved my dream and then because you were living in europe and how old were you uh 18 18 when I, yeah and were your your parents were in europe with you or did they oh, come no, back no, to no. the state no 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 it, it, like i just was living by myself okay yeah i lived in this the i lived in this like little town called la glaze in the ardennes which okay. liege based on the age goes right by it, it like the the town the, the famous climb La Rosier mm -hmm. is right at the top of there is like where I would stay it was it was my house wow yeah it it was like the team director's house <laughs> and it was awesome you know we drive we had the team cars which were these sweet Mercedes so we just would rip those around <laughs> and uh I mean it's funny I wasn't doing anything because like you're just a kid that was so focused on doing your job and being the best that like you just would wake up every day train come back to the house watch like tv and then just go to bed you know eat and go to bed and so like wasn't like this like how most people kind of think you live in europe and you're like paris and yeah like this extra it's like <clears throat> you it was pure work like you were doing it and you were sacrificing a lot you like i said i didn't see you. i would be gone usually for three months and then come home for a month then go back over for three months just to like so i don't have to get these crazy visas so it was just a way to like uh -huh. go through it but yeah my parents never saw me race in europe which is kind of crazy what was your headspace like during that time very boxed in a very boxed in mindset uh just i, I remember when i signed pro i wanted to just be because i was I, I was the best junior in the world like i would won all the big european junior races like i just I was 10th at the world championships in the time trial, but I had won all the big stage races. And so like, it was like, oh wow. Everybody was like the pro, like BMC, they were like approaching me to just be on the pro, the development team and then instantly go straight to the pro team. And so it was like, they were treating me like their top, like GC rider, like, a, a, like a potential GC rider. And so for my young mindset, it was just like go in, I'll go all in, and so I just totally just ate, drink, slept, like slept and uh, did cycling. That's all I read. That's all I like watched on TV. It's all I didn't sketch. I didn't do any art. I was like, I'm just gonna focus 100% on cycling, and it was a big mistake because then I just you got wrapped up in this very b small world of bu bubble and. Uh, you're, cause you're in, you're in that cycling world, you're taking, you're in a bubble. It's crazy. You're yeah. taken care of. You don't have any like worries. Your laundry's done. Your food is cooked. Like you have the, you're c massaged every day. Like you're literally like, just like this top steer. Like <laughs> you're just like taken care of. <clears throat> and, uh, like, yeah, you, uh, you just kind of allowed it to kind of take over your life where it, you, it was my identity. It was all I was, and I remember calling my mom like after like three years and being like, "Oh, I like, I need to do something. Like, I feel stupid." I was like, "I, I would like to go to school." So then we signed up for some classes at the university here, and I did like three classes. I did nutrition, I did art history, and I did a uh, basic like sketching art, like where you work with charcoal and draw live figures and uh, that's where then that changed my whole life like doing that class then that's where it, I, re I learned how to just being a good drawer to then being an artist because you'd have people come in and you'd draw them live or you'd have things set up and everybody would draw it in the class and everybody's picture was different though like because that's just how we all see you know or our our brains are looking at different things 
more than they are another thing. So like it might, your brain might accentuate it bigger or my brain might accentuate the other object bigger or smaller, you know? And so it's funny how we see the same world, but we see it differently, you know? Do you recall the conversation with your dad when you decided that you were, you were going to move on from cycling? Uh, I thought it would be like crazier. Uh, but I, I had a plan in place and it wasn't like, like, uh, they could see I was unhappy that final year and I just was being like screwed over by many different things. And it was like, okay, like what's happening here? Like he's produced, you're, you're producing, but yet a team would lose a sponsor and then that would, you would have a two year contract. A team would lose a sponsor and that would affect you. So that two year contract you had doesn't mean anything because that sponsor just left. And so now what you were getting paid, you're getting paid, you know, only like 60% of what yeah. you were supposed to get paid. <clears throat> it seems like from the um, website, you know, did a little reading that your dad and brother are big into helping you run the business and kind of run your brands and, and what you're doing. Oh yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. My brother, he works at Wells Fargo and, uh, so he's really smart with, you know, finance and everything. And, uh, funny, my girlfriend now does the same thing he does. But when I was, when I was, as I was growing up, he, he handles a lot of like professional athletes accounts and everything and helps them out. And so like, he knew exactly what to do for me when I was a pro and like start a business, get an LLC, uh, and just start growing that where you can then start growing it, you know, and just, handling it different and that was you know and it was funny my brother does that but my brother is the one where like because he would work at wells fargo the night shifts at the international center and he there would be hardly any calls hope his boss isn't even listening <laughs> <laughs> he's his boss i think now but whatever nobody's listening oh, but like night shift yeah he would be the night shift and he, i would call him in europe because my race <clears throat> would be the next day or like we'd be on the same time yeah and he would give me, he's so smart. He's the smartest person I know. And he just analyzes everything. And so like, I would call him about my races and he would tell me like, where to attack, who won in the past, race where strategy. they won, yeah. like all this race tactics. Cool. He He's so smart. Cause he, he, he won a national championship in uh, college baseball. And so he's very athletic and professional, but he's, definitely very keen on like tactics and very keen on like the history of the race and very knowledgeable of it and will look into details about that stuff and then he's really keen he's really a good talker as well like myself he gets on with everybody and so then he became my agent at the end of my career and we would just have some good times like <laughs> talking trash to some teams and everybody because we just knew i wasn't going anywhere or like going anywhere to the like Europe like we just were we knew what I was gonna do and so we just would have fun it was awesome That's I remember cool. watching I took uh, him everywhere though like we partied with Lance <laughs> like I took him on to my Lance's like uh like trailer and like everything when we did the podcast and then took him to Lance's house that same like when and did Lance's race and stuff but like so that was cool like my brother both mine and my brother's <clears> hero <throat> like I was able to like we were to, like like introduce him, you know, get him that ticket, kind of like meet him, you know. Whereas like cool. it was funny, we were having a conversation with my nephew, and he's like, "Oh, I'll never meet Steph Curry." I'm like, me and my brother looked at each other. We're like, "Dude, you never know, man." Like we didn't realize we would be kicking it with Lance. Like <laughs> every one of my heroes I've ever <clears throat> had, I've met, and and in friends in some type of way, you know. Yeah. And it's just was, crazy. Now. Was he your guy? I mean, when you were oh, growing up, was it like every if he wasn't if somebody's saying he wasn't, they're totally lying because they're trying to just I, I don't even know why they're lying. Because yeah. it's not even a big deal. Like it happened and everything happened around it. Everybody was doing it at that time. And it just happened. Like, big deal. Like he's the reason bikes spiked sales spiked in the US. He's the reason Nike got into cycling. He's the reason all the lot I got into cycling. He's the reason a majority of Americans got into cycling. Yeah. He brought the sport to us. And so it's like if you're saying you don't like him, that's fine. But don't say what he didn't do didn't 
progress cycling and didn't help USA cycling and it helped get people on bikes because it did. And he also raised money, you know, did a lot of good for his cancer foundation and everything. And it's like, you can, might not like the person from like his attitude or standpoint, but like did a lot to change the sport and he's still doing a lot to change the sport. So it's like, I, I, and I just have all these friends in that same era, you know, with like, it's like, I'm not even going to, but it's like, they're all different and you just realize how cool everybody is in their own way and in their own form, you know, it's like, but, uh, and you just also have to understand how intense cycling is and how demanding it is. And it's funny meeting all these people and seeing how quiet they all are when they're not on the bike or how kind they like, but then when you put us on the bike, it's like very aggressive competitive spirit you know it's like levi lifeheimer the nicest person i've ever met but i would never have wanted to race against him because he just sounds like he would just would have like <laughs> beat the crap like just totally competitive because he won every you know like you have to be competitive you have to be aggressive and i understood that at the 2019 national championships uh you know somebody cut me off in the peloton and i like started yelling at him and it, that awareness hit me right then and there super strong. And I was like, Ooh, I don't like the person I am right now. Like I don't need to yell at that person. I don't even care about winning this race. Like I mean, I'm just, I, I realized in that moment I was yelling at him because it was like you, your team like expects you to be competitive and turn on that like competitive vibe and like aggressive vibe, which you kind of need to have. You definitely need to have, but I just didn't want to do it anymore. So, like, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. You have to have, you have to, in football, yeah. any sport, you have to be aggressive. And when you turn on that mentality, people have to kind of get out of the way because sometimes you can kind of be, like, you know, not a nice person. I wasn't a nice person all the time. I felt like when I was competitive, yeah. I felt like I was a very, not nice, I was a nice person. I just felt, you feel very selfish and you feel, like, not good you know because you just cycling is a very selfish sport you have to be all in and like people start really surround you and you know do everything for you to succeed and so like you just kind of like don't like that yeah. eventually you're like ooh, i'd rather with all that they give you and um is as cush as it can be i mean you're you're destroying yourself every day you're doing insane training rides mm -hmm. and going out there and and staying fit but with that level of care for a pro rider, it sounds like there's also this incredible weight and expectation. You know, it was it during that time where you were asking your mom, Hey, I need to get into school. I need to, totally. was that your way of saying, I need a way to cope with the stress of yep. the expectation to stay in this? Totally. I mean, you're just, again, I had made it, I had made that competitive and racing my whole identity. And so I didn't know who I was when it was bad. You know, you don't know who you are when you start losing. You know who you are when you're winning. You're like, oh, I just like to win and I'm a winner. Yeah. I'm the best. But when you're losing and you feel like, oh, I'm literally the worst. And you start beating up on yourself, saying really nasty. It's like just crazy. I can't imagine saying the things I'd say to people that I had said in my head, you know. And it's like I don't say those things even close now. But you just weren't nice to yourself in races. And yeah. it's just like you, you, that pressure, it was just a very deep pressure machine. Uh, and like I just, I felt like I was also, at that time, I was Mormon. And I just felt this deep pressure too of like, ooh, force, like be the first Mormon, like kind of pro cyclist and like do that you just kind of had this pressure kind of this community not like in a negative way i'm not saying anything negative but i just felt now that i reflect back like a pressure of this community to like oh do this and again that's not a, a it wasn't a thing why i stopped or like it just doesn't you just feel other pressures too because you grew up in a pressure like machine i grew up like not in a bad pressure machine but like oh i was playing pr like baseball all the time my parents were signing me up so like I always wanted to uh, like execute and perform and <clears throat> be the best. And when me and my parents talk, it's like, I want to like always tell them about the great things you're doing or achieving and doing. 
And so I just, I didn't like losing. And so when I was losing, it made me feel really bad about myself yeah. because I was putting too much pressure on myself, feeling like I need, I made it my identity where if I just had removed myself from it, I, it just, I could do other things now, you know? It, it sounds like you, the, the pressure that you put on yourself, thinking that the community expected you to be those things. Nah, is that that's just that. Yeah, I mean, it just was all pressure on myself. And it's just I feel like a pressure you feel to just always keep up with being a certain standard that, the, you know, the church has you be. And again, this is not a negative thing. I just it I, I felt. And again, I'm not saying that that was instilled in you. That's just every Mormon kid that grows up. You just grow up with a little bit more like structure, I feel like of like or these like standards, not like they're bad. But just because, like, I wouldn't be where I am today without my standards like that, you know? I, I might not be Mormon right now, but I'm not against it in any form. I'm all about, like, anybody going to any church, like, or any form that brings them happiness. Yeah. My parents go to the temple every Tuesday. They're at church every day, every weekend. My mom, sister, same. And it's like, I'm all about that. I'm all about everybody finding their happiness. I'm never talking ill about anything. It just wasn't my... I, and like I'm not saying I felt pressure from it, and that's why I'm not Mormon. It just I just there was just things that just didn't it wasn't my my vibe. Yeah. Like yeah. not even like oh I am against this or against this. It's just not who I am right now, you know. And so it's like, yeah, it's not a pressure. It was just a pressure I probably put on myself, you know, or not on myself because you have it, but. uh I don't know. You grow up with it, I guess. And I don't, but I'm not trying to blame, I'm not trying to blame anyone or anything because my life is freaking awesome. Like, yeah, I want to, yeah. I don't think I have, a, I don't, there's so many people, like, I never once say, like, I have a sad sob story or like try to pull these things that could make me feel like, or people could be like, oh, that's poor him or like, oh, like a crutch in any form or this happened to me. <clears throat> like nothing poor has happened to me luckily in my life and I'm happy to say that like I don't need to be the person that says like poor me or like I'm suffering because there's a person right next to me that could be suffering five times more or a person who's had a terrible accident right next to them that's even worse than their problem and so it's like if we can be aware of that it's not that oh our life isn't people that have a real suffering like they should be aware of that and it's not like oh but i've just realized like you can also feel blessed that you haven't felt suffering and i feel like in today's day and age a lot of kids and people feel like they need to always have this like story of like dang my life or my grow up like how i was raised was hard people because that's like a story people like to have you know and not saying not everybody's is hard but there's like mine wasn't i grew up with amazing parents i freaking like my life was awesome like but i could if i was that type of mindset go and like nitpick things about your my past where it could like try to make me like i don't know but i because you know in media pain and suffering and all that is you know people like to express that more i feel like where it's like okay my life is really awesome. Like, I'm not saying bad, th negative things haven't happened in my life, but there's somebody next to me that could be way worse off, you know, and I live my dream every day. So it's like, why should I focus on the negative of like, and again, I don't even have anything negative. That's what's so funny is like, <laughs> I don't have. What you're describing um, to me is is cool because you're literally sitting in front of your own artwork, yeah. layers of paint, and you're talking about the layers of a life, you know, and cycling was very much some of the first layers of, you know, the, the cycling painting in your life and, you know, doing it at a, a, a super high level, big self expectations, you know, which, yeah. which is cool. I think that a lot of people are like, that's amazing yeah. that he did that, but it's equally as cool. And by the way, I think most people early twenties are also starting to layer on yeah. their canvas. Like, Oh, maybe I'm not just a cyclist. 
maybe yeah, I'm that's these okay. other things. And that's okay. Yeah. It's, it's I mean, discovery. I, I think, again, it's just all self awareness and balance because when I left cycling to pursue art mainly full time, I, uh, I was like, okay, I'm going to be an artist full time. And just like, and I just got addicted to that. And then like when I wasn't selling paintings, I felt poor. And then yeah. you realize, well, that's not like why I'm doing this, you know? And that, of that hit like during like the pandemic, of course it's like that cliche, but it's like, yeah, it just made me like really look inward and be like, oh man, like I'm putting a lot of stress on myself to perform and sell paintings. Cause like it's addicting when a painting sells for what they sell and how easily it can be. But I mean, not easily. You have to paint it. But once it sells, it's just like anything. It feels like you hit the lottery at, in Vegas, <laughs> and you uh, <clears throat> you get it. You want you're like, oh, let's. I want to do that again. Like I want it tomorrow. Like let's do, sell another painting, and you just get it. The same mindset I found my that I was in cycling. So it's like, again, it's our own control. Like just because I left one thing to pursue what I thought was making me happy while I was doing that one thing. Now that one thing is now my, like, yeah. not good anymore. The success selling the painting reinforces yeah. the work ethic and the obsession. And then to I was I was then painting things that I thought would sell rather than just painting. You know, you once you didn't have a cycling contract, you created the imaginary collective or yeah. your brand. Yeah. Tell us, tell us about just the imaginary collective. What all that entails. Yeah. Well, uh, so like I said, on? it started in 2019, and I just. Uh, me and a teammate were just frustrated with kind of just we wanted to do something not frustrated with the team we just wanted to do something different you know and uh, we just realized that we wanted something just different and more and so we were me and him were always scheming always scheming and then I was I did tour uh, the un, uh, Unbound in 2019 and that was my first gravel race and I was out there <laughs> with everybody and one of my best my brother not even my best friend. He's just a brother. He's like, that's like, he's closer. He's like blood is a uh, Taylor Finney. And it's funny. Cause we like just, we've grown up together and like, we didn't like each other when we were younger. But then once he started doing artwork and I started doing artwork in 2016, we really bonded like brothers. Like I was at his art show. We were partying in Tokyo. We were like having the time of our lives and like racing for BMC. And, uh, then, you know, you just like, let's see, let's see, I spaced on the question again. What was, uh, well, just explain it. Imaginary. Oh, imaginary. Collective. So yeah. yeah. So me and Taylor are super close and we were at unbound together cause he was doing it for EF at the time. And he, but he was about, he wasn't happy with his life and like his racing career. And I wasn't happy. And we were just sitting in this like tree house the night before the race. And we just were like at this Airbnb we're like, yo, dude, like, what are you going to do next year? Like, he was like, what would you do next year if you could? I was like, oh, man, I would do this, 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 this. And uh, we did, the, we did the, the Unbound the next day, and it took me and him like 14 hours. We just kept getting flats and hanging out, having fun with everybody. And it was cool. And then a week later, he, like, calls me up as I was on a ride, and he's like, I'm in. And I'm like, what? I was like, what? You for real, like you make real money on EF. Like you're about to do the tour de France. And he's like, no, I'm in. I was like, okay, sick. So then when I, in June of that year, I was with my, uh, best friend and teammate, Andrew Dahlheim. He's also my brother. And, uh, we were at a race tour of tour of Bose in Canada. And I was like, dude, Taylor's in. And we knew just from having Taylor in and myself, it was really going to solidify a lot of brands interested in like supporting us. Mm -hmm. But then it, just as the summer went on and racing and us approaching sponsors to like support us that first few years, it was getting too complicated. They really wanted to like have Taylor by like, like the palm and control him, which as everybody knows, like right now he's, you can't control him. He's a free spirit. And we were, that was the whole point was we were just meant to have fun on this project and have all these different brands support us and do all these cool collaborations. But at that time, it was like ASOS wanted us to work with them really, well, you know, together. And they were only interested, though, in Taylor. 
So as soon as like we figured that out, we were like, oh, no, we don't want to. I called him up and I was like, yo, I think we have to kind of like not have you part of this because it just is like too many people are interested in your name to to like control it rather than let you free like we want to. Yeah. So then that's when he started Manifest Butter and I started Imaginary Collective. But I called Taylor up on a ride and I was like, what do you think of Imaginary Collective? Because I just watched the documentary a ski a ski uh, an awesome snowboarding video uh called as a crow flies by a red bull yeah that was a good one and uh that one just was like I don't know. it was all about imagination and the human spirit and i was like okay like that's that's what i want this brand to kind of be about because that unbound the moment we hit the gravel after the first mile the sunset the sunrise was coming over those fields and it was like this fog and you just realized, like, you're like, wow, there's like, I think 2,000 people that do that event. And you're like, dang, this is something cool. Like, I realized it was about community. Whereas, like, I think the whole privateering thing, they realize they want to, like, race. Which is, like, very, that's not why those, e like, it's funny how those events and even, like, all the, these people have, like, made it about them. Like, doing, like, winning the races. When it's like, yo, those races wouldn't exist if the 2,000 people want to sign up for it and pay the, like, none of the pros pay to do the events. I never did. So, like, they're not making money off pros. Like, and again, a lot of the people doing these races don't care about faster, stronger, fitter. They, like, it's usually like a group of friends that are like, yo, let's train for Leadville. Right. Go out. They all ride together, have <laughs> design kits that match each other or wear the local shop kit that, you know, it's not like they're signing up to watch Lachlan Morton win or like do the event. Like it's sick that there's now that competitiveness to it. But I just realized when I did Unbound that it's not about me. Like, and I realized too, not everybody likes me or like likes my personality or my vibe, which is totally cool. I don't even like, not everybody likes my artwork. I don't, I don't get offended by that because we don't have to like it's just you don't nobody has to like me but i realize okay if i want to live my brand forever i can't make it about me i can't go in the next year and have sponsorships for tj eisenhart that would be easy i had to make sure these sponsors and brands were supporting imaginary collective and like the future vision which was crazy because like i had to tell them the vision that would be five five years from then you know and some brands are still with us and some aren't. And as we've grown and been able to like really show them the path, the best example metaphor I always say is like when you're building a path, you lay one stone down at a time. You know, at the beginning that, that doesn't lead anywhere and people might like just not recognize it. But then after five years, you've built a path that takes you like, uh, or maybe across to an island or something yeah. like something crazy and then everybody's wanting to be a part of it because you've built your own lane you know one of the best things my brand and my like kind of compliment i got this last winter was when one of my best friends at giro was hit up by our our wheel company who we work with now forge and bond they're the best they're out of richfield utah it's they're way cool wow yeah no idea it's super cool and uh they called up these guys at Giro and we're like, Hey, like we're looking for some people that are just like all about the stoke of life, you know? And like are all about the culture of gravel and the sport and our friends at Giro were like, Oh yeah. Imaginary, you know? So it's so cool to have built that where people now can understand what we're, we are about. And it's about the culture of, you know, how cool bikes are, yeah, you know, totally, Love and it. just making them cool and individualistic, like, where people can express that I, I like to express myself on the bike. So I don't want to be on just like a black carbon frame, you know, and a black race kit or a white race kit and look like everybody else. You know, it's like, I think everybody with today's technology and everything we're blessed with and, you know, with resources and creative goods, we can really be like very creative and have everything about us say who we are, you yeah. know? One of the uh, the themes, just hearing you talk and land right there about, you know, you wanting to live loud on the bike. Mm -hmm. I love that. And, and I think it's a theme of this evolution over time of layers 
mm-hmm. you know, that we're getting more and more of, yeah. of the layers of TJ, which is super cool. I love it. You know, I mean, I'm just, as you even say that, I'm looking at the painting behind you and I'm like, it's like, it's a horse. I grew up, you know, yeah. in a, you the country Western, you know, family with mm-hmm. horse people and um, putting loud colors with the horse. That's not traditional. And mm-hmm. I love it. I think it's, I think it's super cool. Yeah. That, it's just. Take us into your mind that way. I want to know the creative mind, you know, of, of TJ. Like when you get out here, mm-hmm. what's, I mean, do you put on a playlist? Like how do you get into oh, the zone? There's always music, always music. Um, I'll come out here, turn on music, usually sit on the couch every morning and just kind of go through what's on my phone, a lot of like messages or emails or ha- just handling that stuff or phone calls. Uh, and then j- again, during that time, you're surrounded by all the pieces. And so your mind is subconsciously taking it all in. And then like, ah, I just, I, it's like, I wish I could describe the process so I could do it. <laughs> But I mean, the best way I can just describe it is just being honest and vulnerable, you know, the more and just living life because then I come in here and I want to express it, you know, and like being honest and vulnerable allows you to then not be afraid of new opportunities. And so then you're traveling to Whistler for a day to go ski, you know, because it's just like, oh, let's just go on an adventure. Like you're not afraid to just kind of do that. And you don't, that doesn't have to be expensive. You know, you can look at ways of doing things, you know, but yeah. still live, you yeah. know? And, uh, so now my creative process is really like, uh, it just happens. It, like, I feel like it just flows out all the time. You know, the other, the yesterday I had a ride on my hand because I was driving my truck, uh, you know, back from, we had flown in from New York and we were driving back down from Salt Lake to St. George and I didn't have my sketchbook on me to write my ideas down and I had to write it on my hand because mm-hmm. so many ideas will hit me that I know I'm going to forget it at the end of the drive or it yeah. might hit me a month later. So like now I have a sketchbook that I ca- carry with me everywhere and uh, it's really cool because now I've really figured out how to like narrow in that process a lot better where I just use that sketchbook to just write down every single idea and every and. It doesn't have to be perfect, but the more I write it down and create it and draw it out, uh, it just becomes like a lot easier to then when I have to produce it. You know, for an example, that's how I create all the designs for the volet kits that we work with, with Imaginary and Volet. And we just dropped, actually today, we dropped our summer jersey. And the summer jersey is, uh, it's like, it's called uh, Lemonade. And it's about making, you know, like making life your lemonade you know like oh i got lemons i'm gonna make my lemonade like it's just kind of that like you know here life gives you lemons make some lemonade and i have that tattoo i have that lemon tattooed on my wrist and i was just sketching in my sketchbook and drawing the lemon and drawing all these kind of cool writing the way i wrote wrote it and everything and i sent it and it just hit me I was like, what if this jersey was yellow? I was in New York and I was like, it just, it just like hit me. And I was like, whoa, what if it was yellow? with the? Because I really liked the lemon. And I was like, that would be crazy for the summer. And I just messaged instantly Brian at Volet. And within 48 hours, the jersey's made, like done. You know, and it's so cool how they they taught me, like, just, you know, just sketch it and they'll create it digitally. And now we have like a, such a cool design where if y'all go, y'all go and see it and there's actually this cool Easter eggs on the Jersey that it's like, it's directly from my sketchbook. So if I take a photo of the notes in the sketchbook, they're hidden on the Jersey or in underneath That's the right. pockets oh, cool. or the, all <clears throat> the designs of all the drawings on those jerseys are in my sketchbook. So those jerseys, again, just like the hats I create or anything I do came from my hand. Yeah. No, nobody, I, and I have such a good relationship with Volet where I don't do anything digitally and I just call them up and take tons of photos and write tons of notes and send it to them and walk, we walk, you know, they just, they hit it on the head. They just crush it. They're the best brand, you know, and easiest to work with. I love that. In fact, when we spoke on the phone, one of the things that had me stoked about coming today to, to spend time with you. You said 
the more vulnerable you are, the better my art is because people can feel my soul. Yeah. And then you went on to describe that the painting is an evolution that you will paint totally. and then you'll come back to it. You'll put another layer, come back. And the layers that you're adding to the paintings are often from the experiences that you've mm -hmm. had, you know, up until that point. And I, that's such a cool metaphor mm -hmm. for life of just, you know, I'm going to paint the lemon, you know, being sour versus sweet and the evolution of it. And yeah. I think that's, that's amazing in terms of just your mindset. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, I think just about kind of experimenting and seeing what's working with what relates, I get what it's, it's, uh, since having my daughter, I've always thought about how can I break things down to a simpler form because I wanted to, her to really appreciate my art and, but I also want adults and to appreciate my art. And so it, it's kind of like funny. You just are trying to find ways to connect everyone in a simple form. And that's why some of my paintings, not all of them, will have like some cartoon characters or like I've used the wolf a lot, you know, and this wolf has his tongue out and like his eyes are spinning. And this one is the first one I ever drew. And I drew it because I had just started dating my girlfriend and you have this massive motivation for life. And you just are like, oh wow, I feel like really life wants me to win and you realize that oh wow you know the universe and then it kind of you hear a song lyric and it hits your brain like wow the universe wants me to win and that's like a humbling moment and a awe like awakening moment and so you're like oh wow okay so that's why the eyes are spinning in the wolf it's kind of like this humility and this kind of like wow wow it hits it the universe does want me to win and then you have the, the tongue out and the mouth open because a coyote and a wolf, they're going to go, they're not going to stop until they get their prey. Like they're not going to go hungry. They're going to get it. And so I was like, okay, well, how can I turn that like aggressive, like, pr like kind of, well, not aggressive, but like motivated way to kind of, you know, metaphor for life. Like you're going to go after life. Like, okay, I'm going to wake up every day and go after it. And so when those two were, when this, those two kind of hit, once I just wrote that, like, and these are all months apart, but one day I just wrote the universe wants me to win right next to it. And that just shifted everything. Like all of a sudden, then I, in all my sculpting and ceramics, I started putting it in everything where Shane was just like, what is this? But it hit me like, well, wait, if I'm writing this every day and then I'm seeing it as I'm drinking my coffee on the cup, and then I'm seeing it as I'm eating, like, or my athletes are seeing this on all their equipment, that's going to be in their brain. They're going to be in the race looking at their bike and seeing, oh, wow, yes, the universe wants me to win. Or how intimidating is it if my athletes are showing up and their jersey says the universe wants me to win on their jersey? <laughs> like, it's pretty, like, <clears throat> ballsy, but it's, like, it's form of, like, getting in you know subconsciously inceptionally getting in everybody's yeah. brains and it's a, a we can all relate to cartoons because we all grew up with cartoons and animation and so that's why i choose to kind of push these subjects you know like in this form because you could also break this and talk about like you could get on serious notes you know and draw more serious or depressing paintings to describe vibes but right. i just choose to do like the positive side because i want like people that are buying my products or clients that are buying my paintings to really feel that energy and they're like i said they're paying the money for that they should feel uplifted like they should feel different they should feel inspired like that's why i have all my artwork in my house hung up in places so that way when i'm as i'm living life and looking at it I can see what it's doing for me and if it's not lifting me up in a way or like then I it, I need to keep working on it you know there's yeah. a painting of a like a the golden like pharaoh mask down my stairs and it's so every morning when I would wake up I would walk down those stairs and see that and like mentally that just makes you just feel like your your mind is then thinking of royal like wealth success 
like I'm a king. I can do this. Like I'm strong. You know, that's like a more like masculine, like vibe where the wolf is a tamer approach that everyone, like I said, from my three year old daughter yeah. to <clears throat> a nine year old old you know lady I meet in the bank, they can all relate to yeah. that. So. Sitting here for a while, I've I've read it several times. Why wants? Like when I think of the saying. The universe wants me to win. Yeah. That shifts my mind even wants versus the universe, you know, thinks I should win. Or, yeah. I mean, that that word wants, I think, is a fascinating thing in terms of just I'd, mindset shift. I, I mean, again, I just don't believe life is, uh, like, against us. A lot of us view is, like, we've had all these hard... A lot of people have suffered a lot of hardships. And, again, I don't know what that's like. So I'm not ever trying to put myself in a, like to know I know what that's like. I don't know what it's like. And, uh, but I think if we can view that, like, okay, maybe these hardships are meant, to, like, we're going to come out of it better. Every time I've had a moment in my life where, I, like, I wanted to give up or quit on something, the next week, it's the best week of my life. <laughs> or, like, the moment I've had a really hard moment, the next day, some I get a message and you, you know, sold this or did that, like, it's just funny how the universe, and again, and I think if we just put that in our brain, then we're we're going to do that. Like, I, I'm a big believer of us making our own path. And so, like, if we can realize that, oh, wow, it's in my control, it's just then a learning about how to, you know, manifest that life you want to live at that time, you know, and, like, realizing, okay, it's kind of these little things that will then add up to it. Like, okay, maybe I should you know, wake up at 6 a.m. and manifest and uh, meditate or maybe I should go for a run. And then th just little good habits just equate to then bigger, you know, like I said, that 15 percent, the cliche thing or the th thing where it's like 15 minutes a day, 365 yeah. percent better at the end of the year. If you, a lot of uh, teens, I think, are get pretty focused and when things don't go right they get extremely discouraged totally and i think your your life as a teen is really unique you've experienced a lot of things that maybe others haven't yet but how what might you want other teens to know that are just discouraged that it's just like us just you know kind of like i just said that it's just a moment in time it's a bad apple it's a bad bad lemon like throw it away like it'll be better tomorrow it's like hard to hear hear that but it will like like i wish i could have just understood that I like not took everything so personal like i wish i wouldn't have made everything so big wish i wouldn't have like made losing a race or dropping that like i was always that mentality you described like oh i got a flat like i'm done like i'm done it's like i don't view that in my art you know now or it's like just because i've slowly learned but like i said the person I am today was not the person I was growing up. So I don't want people to think like I was always like, and I'm not even view myself as like done. Like, yeah, I don't view myself as anything special that people should like look at. I just think what front lessons, some lessons that I've learned is just like, all right, just be calm. Things will be, that everything works out. But like I had to learn that from doing meditation every day. Now I don't meditate every day. I mean, you do in forms with painting and, yeah. but now I just, I've learned to live so purely in the moment that like it is meditating. Like I, do, I, uh, every single day now is like unbelievably better than yesterday. And I don't even know how to describe it. So it's just like, I love that fluidity, the way that you talk about your art. You described that on the phone too, that, you know, that, it's not a mistake. It's just living. Yeah. It's just fluid and it's moving and it's alive and it's, you know, it's progressing. And I think that's super cool. So it's funny how living your life, if you really look at it, is the art. Like, just painting it. Like, but me living is the art. Like, so I can't wait to write a book about all the, everything. <laughs> There's some cool it. stories. We is is we that what the universe wants next for you? Are you going to write a book? Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. What's I've next always from wanted, the universe? I've wanted, always wanted a book after just a few certain, like, things that have happened in my life where it's, like, 
dang, nobody in the world knows. A few people in the world knows about like all this. And it's like, you, and then again, <clears throat> but I don't want it now because it would be, I'm not done. Yeah. Like there's so much I want to live. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. like it's, the stories are just getting better every week. So like. <laughs> Give us one story in the, in the chapter of, you man. know, <sighs> the book of TJ, the book of Eisenhart, actually, that could be like. The new New Testament or something, you know? <laughs> There's just some... I always tell people, like, I just might need a cold beverage in my hand for a lot of those stories <laughs> to come out. But, like, there's just some good ones. I'm not going to share them right now because I don't want to even spoil a lot of them, you know? Like, the best I could tell you is one where it's, like, like a Jason Bourne story in Colombia. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> But I hope that's a chapter just, in the book. You just man. wake up and there's those curtains of like being in a hospital, like Jason Bourne, when he wakes up and he's just like, "What the? Where am I?" And you're just like, "Oh wow, what the heck? This is." <laughs> then you walk across the street and buy a coffee, and you're back on the next, the next plane <laughs> back to like back after the race. Uh, but it's like, I like wow, it. yeah, th funny stories like that uh, just like happen, good. you know. Yeah. But they're worth writing down because. It'll be better. For sure. Finish off freestyle for us. Anything, um, you know, obviously Brainstoke is all about the struggle and stoke of life, you know, yeah. the mental health, you know, of, of everybody. And today mm -hmm. you've shared a tithe. I had no idea that the lemon was tied yeah. so symbolically, which is so rad. Well, everything. Looking at some of your stuff. A lot so. of my, ta I, all my tattoos are, I mean, everything I do, I, it, it's not like I try to be symbolic or like, oh, I got this. Like, again, it's funny. I just, it, I would just was living b above a fruit market and you just start thinking and you just start breaking down. You start thinking abstractly. And sorry, I keep turning my hand like this. <laughs> Everybody on the camera is going to think I'm weird. No, it's just like I'm very hand like, <laughs> but, uh, you start breaking down abstractly because I'm an artist and you start thinking about things deeper and meaningful and how they can affect people. And something as simple as fruit can just looking at a fruit, you're not going to hate a bad fruit. You're going to just move on to the next one. So why can't we just do that with life? A lot of what I do is like what you said, brain soaks all about seeing the positive in life, seeing that we are meant to succeed in this life, seeing that, like, you know, just being positive. And so everything I do is try to promote that, you know, through my artwork or through designs, all our jerseys. If you look at every single one of our jerseys, I always like on the sleeves, on the wolf one, it says the universe wants me to win. So again, how cool is that every day when you're riding, you're seeing that, you know, that's just mentally, I, I always try to do things maybe that I wanted as I was racing or I tried to treat my athletes the way I would have liked to be treated, you know, and the freedom I would have liked to have been given because I think the two athletes I have right now are just like the most special kids and like most talented kids. It's Truman Glasgow and Sydney Nielsen. And it's funny, we didn't like, we never were thinking about expanding the program. And then I had been friends with Truman and his family for years and his brother and I've known Truman for a while and I, he just hit a certain maturity and a level of his racing that I just was like, I saw him at point to point and I was like, he got fifth there against Keegan Lachlan and point to point was the hardest race I've ever done in my life. And for him to do that with poor nutrition, poor, like build up training, build up for it with poor training, uh, nutritional handoffs, like during the race, he was stopping to get his feed. Keegan was running, going through it. Those details that I know from racing in Europe and everything add up massively. So it just was like, and he, his character is who he is personally, personality. It fit with the ethos of imaginary where he just lives life. You see him doing cross country skiing up in his backcountry mountains and then doing backflips off cliffs while people are documenting them themselves, riding the trainer, preparing for the winter. Right. It's like, that's lame. <laughs> <laughs> my my kids out there doing a backflip or doing wheelies on his motorcycle while he's still training. He just doesn't post himself. On, he realizes there's cooler things to do than post himself working out, yeah. like training. Yeah. Like, that's lame. 
Like, we don't need to see you working out or training on the trainer. We want to see you living. And same thing with Sydney. Sydney is so cool and awesome. And she was a personal phone call from, like, Keegan. Keegan and I are really good friends. Love him. And, like, uh, he called me up because I was just, like, really starting to... D he knew I was, like, looking for a female rider to bring onto the program. And he's like, dude, I got this girl. She's, like, perfect for imaginary. Which is funny, like, Keegan has nothing to do with imaginary, but, like, he views, I think he views imaginary as something that's good for the ecosystem of, like, kind of just the sport, you know? Because, and uh, he called me up, and he's like, this girl, she dyes her hair all the time, like, all these crazy colors. She goes to school, really cool personality, everything. He said that he had, like, trained her and everything, so, like, I knew then her numbers, everything, like, training-wise would be awesome. Never once met her, ne never once, like, and then just called her up and was like, hey, like, I want you on the program. Like, you have got, like, outstanding reviews from Keegan. So, like, that's pretty much, and then I talked to her and she agreed. And so, like, it's cool to have these two kids that now we take to events and totally groom and, like, get them, you know, rather than us talk to sponsors, we take them with us to communicate to our friends that, you know, the guys at Volley, you know, we bring them with us. So then they're becoming friends with the people at Volley or the, the people at 100%. So rather than them, like, oh, we broke our 100% shades. Can you email this person to get us a new pair? They're already friends with that person. So they can, it's a quick message of like, yo, like, this just happened. Oh, man. You know, and they're building these relationships where it's teaching them to have relationships with this, like, with the industry rather than view it as like pay me my money sponsorship this year and it's like you're building something different and then i'm treating these athletes like truman and sydney as like they're rock star you know like we're designing jerseys off of their personality so like the helmets behind y'all are their helmets but they're all different but yet they all race for imaginary but that's cool yeah so um wrap up mm -hmm. any way you want you want to talk daughter, family, girlfriend, any shout outs to anybody you want to, but take a couple minutes and, and wrap up any way you'd like. Yeah, no, just stoked y'all could make it here today. Uh, of course, always love to everybody. Every, you know, always love to people that have been supporting me or knew me since I was racing. It's funny, Shane Christ Christensen, my professor now, knew me when I was racing for BMC, just like y'all did. And it's just cool now, you know, I'm grateful for all those people that have always supported me and believe in me and see that and buy my art or do that. So I'm like, I don't take anything for granted. I'm just blessed for everybody's love and that give it to me. And if you don't, I'm still ble like grateful for you. And like, you know, I'm, I'm very blessed for my girlfriend, extremely blessed for my daughter. It's the greatest thing that ever happened in my life. It's cr Everybody knows like when they have a kid, it totally shifts. And, uh, yeah, Andrew, yeah, everybody, I don't know, not accepting an award up here. So <laughs> I don't want to get this. I don't know why you got me talking like, oh, I should. <laughs> no, nah, just everybody knows. I call every I call every single person that really matters to me in my life almost daily or mm -hmm. weekly. So like and it's not like they don't people don't matter to me in my life. But like it, if I was shouting somebody out on here, they already know. They already know. <laughs> and I don't what's, know why they need a shout out. Like, yeah. What's cool, cool though, TJ, when I asked the question, you immediately went to gratitude. Mm. Other people who got you here helped you get here. Oh, it's interesting. Yeah. We ask the question at times when someone immediately jumps to lots of additional advice, a lot of feedback, which is cool too, you know, yeah. but it's cool that you went to, you know, your, your attitude of gratitude for people oh, who helped I mean, you get here, I'm which is cool. If you're not willing to be humbled or like, you know, daily, or just like learn especially from those you love like those those that love you are not giving you poor advice to hurt you or like advice to hurt you you know like there's a lot of things i need to work on in my life and do work on daily that the closest people to me tell me you know and it's like they don't yes i might be sad in that moment when you're hearing that but you realize you're not they're there to teach you to like help you to be better you know so you know you're not talking everybody's ear off you're learning to kind of allow yeah. that space to happen or you're not doing this 
and they're not negative things. They're just people closest to you will give you advice that sometimes when people are closest to you, you don't want to listen to, which is funny, but like those are the people you should listen to because like my mom is the, the, the my biggest critic for my art. There's tons of pieces. She's totally, she'll be like, oh, I don't like that. And then a month <laughs> later, she'll be like, oh, that's actually my favorite. That one is my favorite. But it's like, I grow from her advice or I grow from my girlfriend helping me out with things or people like, my daughter humbles me every day. Like, humbles me every single day because you just realize how much better you can be, you know? You with patience or, you know, a three-year-old daughter is going to teach you everything with patience. And then you stress about when they're 13 or 14. So, <laughs> no, I don't know anything, <clears throat> honestly. I just just want to keep being better. I yeah. think that's the difference. Well, uh, we appreciate your vibe, you know, <laughs> and your attitude. I think those are always. super positive and we can all learn from that. So That's what I'll always happily that's that is what i realized was my super or like i can is just being you and like if i can just be my vibe people like that like and i'm not being confident like cocky like oh people like my energy not if you can be introspective and realize what makes you kind of special at times and realize oh wow like i can make a difference with my positivity not like I have to put on an act, but you just are aware that, okay, I'm a more positive person than kind of the normal. All right, how can that help? All right, well, just yeah. me being me. Like I said, I've learned to, like, not be preachy online and being like, oh, today was such a positive, blah, 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 and just post my life or just do my life or people I meet. I just live my life. And the people that are around are usually, like, they like that at my energy. And it's like I've just learned to not, like, it's not a – act it's funny i think people from social media because in my past it was like that was the only way i knew it, how to express it was like kind of preachy they would think i was like all a fake like but then they met me and they'd be like oh you're cooler than your social media yeah and so then i just kind of have learned to like how to make my social media be what i who i am rather than like all this like flared up peacock you know yeah. right. so your life speaks it well enough, man. I mean, you're incredibly articulate, but Thank you. your your life is doing the speaking, and this was friggin' awesome. What the heck? I'm Thanks blessed for having us here, man. Yeah. Thanks That's for having great. us. I appreciate yeah. it. Appreciate You've had it. your daily dose. Daily dose.